The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, IRS Limited, ABN 47060313359, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to Advice 2030, where we explore the future of financial advice. I'm Peter Diamantidis, and in this series, we're diving into the seven megatrends identified in a joint report by Deloitte and Iris. But before we look to the future, we're starting with how advisors are already using technology to boost efficiency and create great client experiences right now. Throughout the series, we'll also hear from Iris leadership about how they're turning insights from the report into action and what's coming up next on the product roadmap. So let's get started. Could your business take on 30 more clients? Through X-Plan, IRS is on a mission to help advice businesses boost efficiency and free up capacity. The goal? To help our industry get ready for the $2.1 billion advice opportunity revealed in the Big Shift research and to help bring more advice to more Australians. X-Plan, unmatched in advice technology. So today we have a truly exceptional guest with us, no pressure, Tim, a dynamic financial advisor who's really had this fascinating career trajectory. So I feel like I've got to introduce that for the listener so that we get some context before we dive in. So at just 19, Tim was already making some waves, project managing a team at IBM to create a machine learning robot, which feels highly relevant given AI and the things we're dealing with now, that sort of headline keynote presentations across the globe. Fast forward a few years and he was leading the analytics team at Village Roadshow, cinema, I love all that sort of stuff, revamping their entire modeling suite. And this is for giants like Warner Brothers and HBO. Now he's actually the head of operations at Pivot Wealth, which is one of Australia's fastest growing financial advice firms. And he co-founded with Ben Nash the Smart Money Accelerator Financial Education Platform, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, And he also you know, collaborates with boards across various industries bringing this really interesting, unique blend of tech and finance expertise to the forefront. So today, we're going to dive into the tech stack that powers Pivot Wealth and really explore how Tim leverages technology to streamline their operations and deliver some top-tier financial advice. Tim, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome, welcome. Thank you very much. The pleasure is all mine. I appreciate it. Oh, this is exciting. I actually feel like we should. I should just be quizzing you on things I want to know, right? Because <laughs> like the listener, just quietly go aside, right? Because I want to hear all the things. Now, let's kick off with just the tech stack as a concept, because I think historically, I mean, you have been embedded in technology from day one, really, in your career. But for lots of advisors, it's just been a thing they have to use. You know, it's just this tool, right? Whereas I've sort of come to the conclusion in our business and and watching the industry that, you know, tech is now this infrastructure asset and we sort of need to treat it that way, much like human, you know, our staff are a key asset. What's your take on that? Yeah, look, I I 100% agree with that. I think it has gone on its own journey itself. Like uh, if we wind back even a couple of years, particularly with financial advice tech, it was just there to help us do something and Mm -hmm. that. We were treating tech as almost an accelerator for our ability to do things and making decisions around, this is what I want to do. How do I go about doing that? Yeah. I don't necessarily think that that's going to change. However, it is definitely an asset. And like the majority of other assets, it requires a little bit of maintenance. It requires a bit of changing. It requires uh, some level of skills to be able to adapt it to the things that change around it. I think it's something that is going to continue to become more and more uh, part of like the valuation of businesses, if I'm being yes. honest, so picks up a business or buys a business, it is going with it. And yeah. I know that there will be businesses that will get sold just for their tech stack if that is the thing that they are absolutely like fundamentally the best at. Yeah. And it, in fact, I can see it also conversely being a barrier to say a merger, because if it is difficult to do that, that mer- that grab that synergy that really mergers are all about, what's the synergy of bringing these two groups together? 
the tech stack could be the barrier. You know, if you can't make that shift, if you can't either blend them or transport one into the other, you know, this is going to be a key part of lots of decisions going forward for business owners. 100%. 100%. Yeah. And I feel we'll dive into it in a little bit, but a lot of those elements as well, like particularly if we're look, looking at and mergers as an example, or even a business is moving from one end to the other, there's actually a whole other niche of tech that sits in part of that transitional period. Like, can it just be a plug and play or does a lot more need to happen in between? I think that in particular, that's actually improving, which is quite exciting. It's <laughs> something that I'll we'll be chatting about shortly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the relief, uh, anybody who's ever tried to move a core piece of tech they use, particularly the our industry ones, historically has been through that pain, right? We've all experienced that where it seems really easy and all of a sudden it becomes really difficult, like we've all been there. So I'm with you that any any part of that that makes that smoother um, is just, it's so important, you know, it's so important so that we own our tech stacks. That's it. Yeah. So let's dive into the tech for the practice. You know, I'd imagine there's not like two or three. So I'm betting <laughs> that you could list off loads. And rather than, you know, just make this episode all about this listing off loads of tech, let's start in the middle in sort of core. What do you guys see as the core pieces of tech that the team use? Yeah, it's interesting. That there's definitely not two or three. Uh, I will call that out. Um, we predominantly use actually 30 different softwares and platforms across the entire business, which, uh, look, it sounds like a lot. Um, that being said, like when we were designing the tech stack, the way we did it was we designed it based on uh, engine rooms or, or business units for another way of putting it. So we have a tech stack that's specific to our sales and marketing, another tech stack that's specific to our client delivery and set success, which is the key engine room of our advice business. Yeah, that individual engine rooms, the client delivery and success, so all things about advice, that actually realistically only has about six in there with the core elements being our X-Plan it is our advice CRM. So that is a massive, massive element for the delivery. My prosperity is something that we use quite a lot as well. It's our client facing component of that. Yeah. And then but a, a general tech, which sits around it. So we've got our, our Zoom, our Google workspace. We're not a Microsoft-based business uh, as well. And there are other, a couple of others like forms and things like that that sit there. But uh, Iris or X-Plan for the advice delivery, that is the core of, of our advice CRM, if you will. And I'm curious because, it, I mean, what a way, great way to describe it that I actually don't know that I've heard in the industry much before where it's it's these different engine rooms and looking at the tech stack a bit differently across them uh, because jamming in marketing tech and try and make it fit within the advice, like it just doesn't work, does it? Because the needs are so different. Yeah, that's it. And we, uh, diving right in, like we've sort of taken, a, we've made a conscious decision about two and a half years ago to shift gears. What we were previously looking at doing was using, well, you get the, the age-old challenge. Do I want best in class or yeah. do I want best all in one? Mm-hmm. And look, there's you can sit on either, either camp. Like if I'm a solo advisor business, I'm probably going to go for one versus if I'm a multi-practice, sorry, multi-advisor business, doesn't necessarily make sense. No. And then you add elements around costs and integrations and things like that. We made the decision to go more towards the best in class rather than a best all in one. And that's why when we did that, it's like, well, if we're going to do that, let's lean in. If yeah. we want best in class, let's get best in class for marketing and we'll do that. If we want best in class for advice tech, let's go all in and we'll do exactly that as yeah. well. So there are techs that sit across each of the engine rooms. Don't get me wrong. We've got our, our practice stuff like our file storage, our Zoom, our Google and things like that. But the other things, we want to focus on how do we improve the team's journey, the team's time and the client's journey and the client's time. So we'll uh, we'll use tech to accelerate our ability to do that. And I'm curious then, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I've always sort of said that if you try and get something that does everything, you just get a really bad like caravan, you know, like you, instead of a house and a car, you know, well, it'd be great if you just had those two, you've created this clunky caravan, which just doesn't do anything well. It's fine. Like it sort of gets some job done, but it's pretty ugly and it's awful and it's clunky. Um, so I think it makes a lot of sense to your point though, for the listener, depending on how big you are, this is a key factor, I think, in these tech decisions. A, do you even have somebody that can look at this for you? Like if you're it, then, you know... <laughs> 
but they, they don't have a team, right? They don't have a team that can sit aside <laughs> looking at these issues and and really thoughtfully apply some energy. So having one thing that knocks off of quite a few of the tasks makes a lot of sense until you get bigger and that's okay. Is there any though techniques or approaches you've applied that meant you guys could adjust over time? You could change what you used? Like, was there anything about the way you treated your data or anything like that that meant if you had to make a change down the track, it wasn't a complete disaster for you? Yeah. Yeah. That's a really great question. And the answer is yes and no. Like, if yep. we're looking at the advice CRM, maybe taking a couple of steps back, this is actually like bringing back memories of when we did a shit. So, yeah. Two and a half to three years ago, what the business looked like from a tech stack perspective uh, was we were using Practify as our yes. advice program, so built up Salesforce. We were using Advisor Logic to do a lot of the modeling that we do for clients. And then we were using My Prosperity as our client portal, but it was only being used after the advice was being implemented because when clients were connecting everything, it was the the next stage because there was new bank accounts, new investments and things like that. Yeah. Now, calling out, this was three years ago and right. the landscape shifted and features have shifted significantly. So yeah. I wouldn't say that this holds today and this is probably just a, an experience share. Yeah. And, but at that point in time, we we were seeing so many inefficiencies with double handling of data. And every business that is listening is a snowflake in their own right. Like yeah. maybe the off the shelf will get you 70% of the way. And there's a couple of other things that you just try and plug the gaps for. Yeah. That was us. Like we were in the same boat. Yeah. And we made a couple of changes fast forward and we we went to the market and we're like, hey, we're looking to make a change. This is we're ready to scale up. Like what's got us to this point isn't necessarily going to get us from this point. So like yeah. conscious decision, let's chat to a couple. We spoke to a handful, Iris, Midwinter, uh, Advisor Logic, Advice Revolution, just to name some of them. Yeah. And then we ultimately decided, all right, uh, we're going to go down the Iris path. And Iris were great. They really supported us in that respect. That was how we got to the decision. But now like, the game is won and lost in the implementation. <laughs> yes. Your question in the implementation, I realized that this is a monster of a job because we hadn't prior to that done a lot just to preserve and update the data that was already there. Yeah, the data was coming from Practify, but like the uh, for the the core of it, I suppose. Yeah, and getting Practify data into X Plan was an absolute mission. But in doing that, in going through that experience, uh, myself and one other person on our team managed to do that. And we learned so much around the preservation of data and how to ensure that it doesn't become stale over time. And uh, when you fix a system, it's you fix the system first, then you fix the backlog. Because if you just start chipping away at the backlog, that finish line is just going to move further and further away. (laughs) In doing that, we're like, we've got a fresh start. Like, this is an unreal opportunity to start fixing the system of the way that we track and keep our data. Yes. And now that we've done that, three years down the line, before we pulled that lever of uh, jumping out to the next route of scaling, there's been a lot of lessons there around the data to make any of those transitions from here on out a lot easier. Yeah. And it's also just recognizing the strengths of these platforms. Like, if if I expect my fish to bark like a dog it's just not yeah. going to work it's yeah. not going to happen yeah. so if i some of these texts to do things that other texts do and i put the data in there to try and manufacture that and then i've got the same thing in three spots well i'm not setting myself or the business up for success so we're not really agile and allowing for that next stage yeah is it perfect absolutely not absolutely not but it like can it be right that's exactly right. Like with the moving goalposts, all you can do is put yourself in a position to be really agile and just know this data, it's there, it's preserved there, it's updated there. This data, it belongs over there. Let's not mess with it. And it's so interesting, isn't it? Because it's it's super easy for us to go, tech, they just make the data crap. Like we're us blaming the technology when actually great data comes from the humans, right? It's the users and I mean, we've had to, I don't know about you guys, but we had to significantly change what well, tweak our processes such that we were being quite religious about the things we updated. And I don't mean data transfer. I just mean within the one tool, making sure that when we got a new piece of information, we were updating the system so it was truly live. Yeah. 
yeah, and to that point as well, we we did the same thing. Like a, as an experience share, we actually changed processes to put in extra steps, which does take more time. Yeah, to put in extra steps to verify, check, adjust, and make sure that the data is actually there and ready to go, because it saves us so much time on the other yeah. side, and it's a it's a more valuable client experience and client journey. Like no client likes to see a number that's incorrect. Like no. to talk about casting a shadow of doubt on the validity of any sort of advice you provide. When someone's making five, six, seven figure decisions, that's incredibly important to get it right. It really is. It really is. And great automation. Like we're all talking about the wonders of AI and all this sort of stuff. It's only going to be possible if we have great data. Like there's no point even starting it unless you've got your system and all the data in it is great and even probably richer than anybody is having any of these systems. I actually think we're going to have to be putting even more in so that then it can be triggered or like all these automatic things can happen. But to your point, you know, don't worry about automating some things if you're not making sure the data is lickety split, you know, (laughs) like it's got to be and it's got to be courage. You know, it's it's got to be right now, um, living, breathing uh, for each client. And I mean, I'm curious, you mentioned, you know, you've got to chip away at these things. I'm betting then that you guys had like implementation activity and then what rolled out just new behaviors so that people were then upgrading the data and what was in it over time. Yeah, that's right. And so when we when we made that transition um, to X-Plan, the business hadn't used X-Plan before, so we had okay. to do quite a lot as far as uh, we're building out processes again mapping them from point a to point b for anyone that is making that shift take your time it is an opportunity to look at everything and it's it's, it was such a blessing like looking back on it it was it it wasn't a small amount of work it was a little bit complex but we got the support like we got the support from iris to do that there were other practices that i could reach out to uh, as well to support in it but we brought the tech on. We went through a significant amount of training with the team, both using external resources and internal resources. And we changed the processes to ensure that, because like you said, it's rubbish in, rubbish yeah. out. Yeah. It's one of the first, first things that we focused on was, okay, you know how to use the tech at a basic level. Number two is data integrity. Like that is the most important thing because if we, if, the plane starts going and it's one degrees off its trajectory. We let it go for a while. We all know how that is. So yeah. it was the same for us. Like this is crystal, this is crystal clear. It's the most important thing. We spent a lot of time just on data entry and how to ensure that it stays up to date, what's important, what's not important. And then we built it into the process from there. It was new. Like we didn't have that into the process before we moved, but it's yeah. still to this day, two and a half years later, there's still elements of that that are in the process. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because it's um, it does require a team view or mindset because sometimes 10 or 15 seconds on top of a task for one team member saves 45 minutes for another one later down the track, right? And that's the trade-off because somebody's going to go, this is taking me longer than it used to. That's going to happen when you do this work, but we know that takes a little bit longer for you, but that person over there is about to give you a big hug because you've just (laughs) saved their receding airline because of the difficulty you have for a task down the track. And so it is, it's a bigger picture thing, isn't it, that you've got to look at it when you're doing these processes. Oh, yes, 100%. And it, like there's multiple stages and multiple people involved in, in our process in, in particular. And it was just ensuring that everyone was aligned to why we're doing this. It's There was an element of trust me now, believe me later, that also everyone got around it. Like everyone got on the bus. And it's like, God, that makes a lot of sense. We can see the value and yeah, it, it's working. It, it is working as well. Yeah, Absolutely. And so I'm I'm curious, I mean, we're here to in part talk about Iris and, and X Plan. I'm curious, you know, which elements did you guys end up taking up and did you roll them all out in a hit? You know, how did you go then about implementing them in the practice? You know, did you have the advisors beating down your door saying, Oh, we want to do this faster? How did that all work for you when you made that transition? Yeah, there was a few elements to it. So firstly, why we made that transition, as I touched on a little bit earlier, was mm. because we to see some inefficiencies and some double handling um, yeah. across multiple steps of our process. And the way that we designed the process at that point in time, there was multiple people and multiple steps. So this was starting to compound and, and bubble away. Yeah. And 
calling out like the the set of the tech stack that we had at that point in time was phenomenal for where we were as a business. We prior to making this tech decision, we were staring down the barrel of okay, we know what sort of growth uh, we're looking towards and we're building towards. Let's preemptively start to lay out the infrastructure to support that, so that we're not chasing us chasing our tail for like mm-hmm. a way to put it. It's like if you've got a small crack, if you start to grow, that crack quickly becomes a really, really big crevice and yeah. that's going to detract. That's really going to detract from the core of your business, which is serving more clients more effectively with yeah. a greater in some instances. So because we had these inefficiencies around double handling, which the team were already experiencing, and there were um, some challenges with the integrity of the data, which the team were also experiencing because they were right. front line. It was it was all coming together. Like business, we want to scale. Team, look, here is some gaps. So like, okay, let's see how we can do, at the very least, let's see how we can merge this and this together so we can cut out that big step. Yeah. For a bit of context around us as a business, one of the one of my favorite pieces around um, X plan, which we'll get into it in a little bit, is the the modeling and the right. visualize. As a business, we do about five models per client. And so that very, very quickly becomes three people doing about 75 models a fortnight, three people. And that's not their full-time job either. This is a small part of these individuals' roles. So it's like, that's a lot of time that we're spending on taking data from one to data to two to then actually doing the models. So let's see how we can bridge that gap. So we had a look. We're like, we want a bit of an advice CRM. Modeling is incredibly important to us. So for any business, find out what that important piece is for you. Yeah. And then there were a couple of ancillary things around task management and a a little bit around being able to report at a team-wide level on certain things. Right. So when we went to each of those, we predefined our set of criteria. So when we spoke to each one of those platforms, like this is what's important to us and Look, it's in some instances, there is a little bit of a sales conversation there. So I just wanted to make sure and be really grounded around this is what's really important. There might be a couple of shiny objects there. <laughs> this nuts and bolts, like this is what we're going to stick through to. Yeah. And then ultimately, we we had those conversations. We had a chat internally as well. And, and we picked we picked that path based on those things that were really important to us. And sure, we, we got the benefit of some of those shiny objects, which we now use, but it didn't sway our decision back then because yeah. we knew what we were after. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it is an interesting, um, the shiny object. I mean, I have, I'm i terminal on that. I am terrible, right? I get so excited about these new things when you're actually trying to solve something really fundamental. You know, in the practice, it's like, Peter, fix this thing first, would you please? Because this is what's driving us nuts. Stop getting, you know, attracted by these other bits that's attached to one of those options. You know, just focus on that. I'm interested you know, you're talking about growth and growth is so interesting, isn't it? Because we can start, like you say, with a model or even a stack or even a team, the way the team is structured that works where we are now. But when you look at growth and trajectory, it amplifies good as well as it amplifies challenges. And resourcing is one of those things where often we just think we need to throw bodies at it. Like, oh, that's, we're growing fast. Hi, thousands of people. Like that's quite, (laughs) it's a normal reaction, right? That we all do that. But tech not only can make that process easier, but can also mean you'd only need to do half as many. You know, you don't have to do as much hiring. Have you guys seen the impact of that? Have you seen the fact that it has meant you haven't quite had to go as hard as you thought you might have in recruiting? Yeah, it has definitely highlighted that. And we've sort of taken the approach of like, how can we get more with less rather than the standard convention of, I need more, let's just bring more in. And that that is a... It's a mental battle. It is a slog. It doesn't happen overnight because we don't have PhD data element analysts sitting on the on the bench that can help out to help uh, bring any of this to fruition. But mm. taking that approach of how do we get more with less and being incredibly rigorous around uh, implementing that over two years, like this is not something that's happened overnight. And it's not, it doesn't come from one person. It stems from the team as a whole. Like everyone is practicing that. How do we get more with less? That has flown into our tech, which now we are definitely seeing uh, the benefits from. It's allowed us to not necessarily pull back on the hiring because we've got those growth targets, but it's allowed us to be refocusing who we are hiring. So okay. Yeah. 
less in the way of support roles. Now we can bring in the frontline roles because we know that the tech actually supports um, things that otherwise we had support team doing. Yeah. So it is allowed us to improve the the efficiency of the hiring and the speed of the scale per se. Yeah. Um, and it is redefined for roles. Like we we are currently looking at bringing in roles that, truthfully, if you asked me two years ago, I wouldn't have thought that would even be on the runway. Um, yeah. But the tech has helped instruct that. Yeah, which is interesting, isn't it? I mean, I've, I'm I'm even seeing this from a broader business perspective with the difference between strategy on a topic. It can be any topic, like marketing. The difference between getting strategy assistance versus the brute strength assistance, because of AI and all these tools now, if you can get somebody with some insight from the strategy strategy sense, like you're doing, right, from tech, then you don't necessarily need as much brute strength because there's so many more tools that can help you do that now, you know, whereas before we needed this, the leader and the bodies, you know. So that sounds like what you guys are starting to roll out is let's just get that strategic insight, let's get the smarts, and then, you know, utilize tech and processes to get the rest done. Yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. And I, I back that as a, a, an approach or a philosophy. Like the tech is there to support what we're trying to do. It doesn't instruct what we're doing. And yeah. we keep that really core. Cool. Like we're trying to design a customer journey. We're trying to design a team journey. The tech is just there to support that. So unless you've got the architects that are designing these things, this tech alone is just, it's not going to achieve those things. Yeah, for sure. Completely agree. I mean, you talked about the modeling being one of those things and it is... <laughs> Modeling has always been clunky in our industry, right? And in the data entry, and then like all of, it's always been anytime you get humans entering numbers, right? Uh oh, you know, it's all bad. Is there any other examples of what what you managed to uncover or discover with this process where you've just made a particular step or a, or a particular process just so much easier for everybody? Yeah, the the modeling is a really interesting one, and the reason we we went down this part in particular, as I said, like that set of criteria was we want to remove the handling so that yeah. we can reduce the error increase See, in using xplant as an example we were able to import all of the fact find data so getting a little bit technical so please yeah me back we, gotta, <laughs> we go down to but we're able to import that fact find data which the clients had entered that was step one step two was we added in the additional step around us authenticating the data speaking to the client to see is this correct is this actually what they meant is there something that sits behind that yeah. That was step two. And then step three in x is us quite literally pressing a button and then that fact find data goes into the base of our models. Right. So there is no lost in translation. It goes from here to here and that saved us a ton of time in both the actual doing but also the integrity. It's so much greater because the time that we'd spent on putting in the data, now we're just verifying or authenticating right. the data. So we get that bit of the lens. Other than that, because it is uh, it, it is an all-in-one platform, the other things that we really looked at was other elements where the data entry is a risk. So right. yeah, it can be in a bit of a risk. That comes into things like product comparison, as yep. an example. So again, it's in the one spot. If we spend a little bit more time just ensuring that everything's put in correctly, once that is done, we can do the models. We can do the product research, product comparison, you produce your document from that same spot as well, three for one. We've got yeah. now that flowing into there. So that was that's for us. That's been the biggest changes around the efficiency piece for using a tech like X plan as an example. Yeah. yeah. And I'm betting that I mean you're gonna see that in other things down the track just by having that focus and and picking something for the for the advice team specifically, just just streamlines across all those those areas. And focusing on this, you know, the data just flowing naturally, uh, that's it's going to turn up again. You know, there's going to be other places where life's just going to get easier because of that, for sure. What are the what are some of the limitations you encountered? So you've gone to the tool, well, you're now not entering multiple things. You, I mean, your advice team must be like, Woo-hoo, this is fantastic. I mean, confidence is an interesting thing with data, right? So you know, as a oh, yeah. as a, a financial analyst in my past life you know, then your confidence in the numbers you were using can speed up your analysis because you're like, yep, looks good, I'm off, I'm going to start running some scenarios, whereas they were probably second-guessing the data and themselves a bit. So even that's got some value, right? I can see that that can really get them cooking. Where's some barriers you've hit? What have been some limitations you've hit where you've had to maybe go, I don't know, outside of X-Plan or, or ask for more from them to get the job done? Yeah, so look, to this day, there's certain elements around the advice that we provide which – 
none of the conventional tech platforms support like yeah. still t- to this day and that that comes from either the fact find or the actual modeling like there's things we just can't model because of the complexity of them yeah so look there's some limitations in there but hats off to the team at x planner in particular we've done a little bit of work with the team at visualize and uh shout out to ashley Beef, who's been awesome in that respect it was quite fortunate to because we were using some of these tools so frequently it was like all right well we're getting hours and hours and hours of testing for virus. Like we're testing it for them. Let's provide a little bit of feedback. And they reciprocated that with open arms. And like a key example was um, for anyone that's in the weeds on using X tools plus new features like the investment bond feature. Like that was something that we reached out. We're like, hey, this is one of the things that we're trying to like do a band-aid solution on. But a lot of our clients are using them. And I'm like, is there a way that we can start to work together to, to build this into it? We fast forward six months down the line, it's now there. Like there's a version of that that has worked. Some of the challenges that we have faced uh, using a platform like Xplan as an example, but I know for a fact that it is a challenge that sits across like the broader financial advice tech when it's yeah. very, very specific in, in this instance, it is that integration challenge for us. So mm-hmm. we do, and we we made a conscious decision to do that. So we recognize the drawbacks and the risks of doing it, but we've gone for an integrated tech stack. We've gone for best in class 90% of the time rather than the best overall. Yeah. Now, when you do that, one of the challenges is ensuring that each of these elements can talk together. Otherwise, the best in class comes with an added layer of, okay, now I need to move data from here to here. Yeah. And that comes with risks. And to your point, when that data is incorrect, you do burn a little bit of trust and uh, yeah. that erode some confidence. And uh, yeah. that's not the intent there. Yeah. And like, from an analyst perspective, if you start seeing data that looks a little bit funky, you start to question everything. And yeah. that does, that probably becomes a, a little bit of a segue into a little bit of analysis paralysis. But look, if that happens, just go back, verify, rubbish in, rubbish out, just yeah. start there. Um, the integrated tech stack, it continues to be a, a challenge for us in connecting them like as a, a real use case or a genuine example. I'd say that the, look, controversially, I'd say that the biggest asset from a tech perspective in our business is actually our marketing and sales tech stack. Right. And the advice tech stack is there. The marketing and sales tech stack is, uh, look, I think it's beautiful. If yeah. I'm being honest, it's definitely yeah. not. But- that that has utilized best in class and due to the nature and the speed of a lot of that industry, they talk to one another through Jeez. native integrations like there's no tomorrow. And if they don't, there's plugins that you can use, things like Zapier and other elements, which yeah. you put it all together. Now, that works fantastic for the client journey as well, which is why I enjoy it so much. Yeah, But then when we transition from that, stage of marketing and sales into the advice delivery there's a little bit of a barrier there which does make it quite challenging for us and it does require at this point still to this day manual input from someone yeah. to make that transition uh, across so look that is one of the biggest challenges things are improving don't get me wrong like there is uh, we'll call it integrations or data highways for advice tech which are coming up and up and uh, like my prosperity is one that we have been using quite a lot, my prosperity and X plan. That was a phenomenal uh, bit of progress for us yeah. as a business. I'm confident there's going to be more of those that come through. Yeah. And it is so interesting, is it? Because I'm I'm enmeshed in all, of, I would call them like entrepreneurial tools, like all that stuff, like sales and marketing stuff right, that's out there. I mean, they're so integrated. They have got to the point where they're suggesting another tool you should use with theirs. Like they're actually, like you're in the tool and it's saying, don't you want us to just connect to Canva or whatever the thing is? Like it's it's <laughs> nudging you to do this stuff. I'm like, this is fantastic, you know. So I'm with you there. I think though we shouldn't be afraid of doing what you've done. And then if you've got to have somebody manually once in a while pressing a button that triggers something, it's still going to be better than whatever else you might come up with, you know. Okay. So I just – sometimes it's going to be manual, but as long as that's part of the process – you know, as long as it's automated to the extent that it nudges somebody to press the button, then That's it's it. still, right, it's still going to be slick. It's, I think the the mistake we all make is forcing people to remember processes too much, you know, making cool. sure that, right, I'm a big fan of anybody should be able to pick this up and follow these steps. Are you guys the same? 
Oh, yes. Yeah, very much so. Uh, that That's very, very risky and uh, it makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, maybe if, look, if it was a different size business, then maybe you could fly by the, the pantsy seat, like maybe yeah. you could get away with it. But what we do is too important for, yeah. for something like that because that maybe we don't see the risk or the challenge and uh, at the risk of being overly hyperbolic, but missing a step can cost thousands of dollars and that stuff is not easy to no. find. But to take a step back just um, around to what you said uh, before with the, the entrepreneurial tech stack and how that works, I, I think like one thing that uh, I can't take credit for, for this statement, but one thing that I heard from a gentleman named George Bryant, who is an mm-hmm. absolute weapon with customer journey, that is his specialty. Yeah. It was relationships beat algorithms. And that sort of really, really stuck through to me. It was like, I'm my my role, and I naturally sort of gravitate towards let's automate it. Let's make yeah. this as efficient as possible. Let's just make this really seamless and build a, the Rolls Royce of, of tech. And I'm like, well, hang on, that takes a lot of time. That takes uh, away from doing other things. What is really important, and what was really important, and still to this day is, is the client journey. So if bringing in someone to click a button to get data from A to B is required to preserve or improve the client journey, I'm not going to shy away from it. It doesn't matter if it's not automated. It's just what is more important to us, it's that client journey. So the tech's just going to help us accelerate that. If we can't automate it, yeah, don't worry. I, I don't need the Rolls Royce to get from A to B in, in everything. The Corolla will do it yeah. and the Corolla is lovely. So let's just go with that and focus the energy on the next thing. Yeah, I you, we've got to you know hold back from chasing the space shuttle every time. Like that's to me that's the extreme. I say that all the time. Right? Could be a Corolla. Nope, went for the space shuttle. Awesome. You know, it's just completely unnecessary to get me up to the shop up the road. Um, and it's natural in tech to do that. Uh, I'm really curious. You know, looking forward, you guys do have some big growth plans. I am confident you have been a hatching all sorts of plots of product, you know, offerings and and programs and all sorts of things down the track for your client base, you know, how are you seeing the technology stack either evolving or, or expanding over time to support that? Yeah, I think there's been a lot of fantastic improvements and it's not even just the advice tech. So as far as those growth plans go, we, we all know that advice is evolving and digital advice delivery is becoming more and more prevalent uh, mm. in the industry. I personally don't see that taking away from the relationship element. And I think that there's going to be some level of morphing of the two together. Yeah. But uh, my view on this, and I'll probably just just speaking from uh, my perspective, is that the the tech in the industry is evolving. The tech outside of the industry is also evolving. And yeah. I actually believe that the tech outside of the industry is evolving far quicker yeah, and there's a lot there that we are looking to use and are currently using that is supporting our client journey and providing more to our current clients and future clients. As an example, we mentioned before the the Smart Money Accelerator mm-hmm. program. That was our way of providing some of the education and the resources that we do one on one with clients in a one to many fashion. Yeah. Now, in in that, so that is uh, for all intents and purposes, it is an advice education products there's a general advice in there there's licensing that sits behind all of that that entire product does not use a single bit of financial advice tech yeah well that is off the shelf other industry tech um yeah. granted there's a little bit of matching mixing building to to get it to work but no advice tech whatsoever and as far as the growth plans for us go, we know that advice tech and uh, the core function of providing personal advice, it's going to be huge. Hmm. The the tech changes are going to support and accelerate our ability to do that for more people and in more impactful way. I don't necessarily think it will redesign what we deliver, just how we deliver it. Yeah. And then the other tech that sits inside it, that's going to accelerate our ability to impact more people because we can offer more in a, a more structured way and still stick to the compliance elements that are yeah. required um, and to do it in an off-the-shelf. You don't need someone who's an absolute weapon at X, Y, Z encoding to be able to get something like that um, off the ground. It is exciting, is it? Because the I think you know many people out there would love to have more of an impact. Like we all would love to be able to help more and and for many reasons, not 
the least of which is the complexity of literally the what we do, but also the legislative environment we operate in. That's very hard. But the more we can have, and one to many is, is an expression I use too, this impact you can have across multiple people. Is it the same as one-on-one advice? Well, no, but neither should it be. This is empowering people to make some progress, you know, and progress is still transformation. <laughs> it doesn't mean it's the complete transformation, but it's still getting them a long way there. Yeah, exactly. And we're we're not trying to take what we currently offer in a one-to-one and replicate that in a one-to-many. They're different audiences. Yeah. They're different audiences with different challenges, different wants and different needs. So I'm not going to take this square peg and try and put it into that round hole. Like it just doesn't make sense to me to to do that. That like we we were fortunate that we had the resourcing, we had the the content that we could use for that. So we've gone gone down that route. But it, again, we, we weren't really just throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. There's plenty of things that we can do, whether or not that's what we want to do and whether it's on brand, is it on the way or is it in the way? Like, yeah. it, It's one of those age-old things that goes back to, okay, what's your decision-making process across the business? And the yeah. tech, as I said, it's it's very easy to see the tech is, oh, the tech does that. Let's go down that route. It's like nuts. Step back. What are we trying to achieve? Yeah. Does the tech? then support that? Do we need to look at something else? Maybe. Do we have to wait a little bit of time for the tech catch up? Right. Right. And and I think, I mean, you mentioned, you know, customer experience or the journey or how would CX, however you sort of view that. But as that being the touchstone for all of this, like you say, it's not that the tech is immaterial, but it's just secondary, right? It's, you come back to what experience you're trying to deliver on and then you work out. <laughs> How are you going to do the tech? Whereas I do think it's it, and I sort of view legislative as you know issues as well. Like what what do I want the experience to be? Okay, this is what I want it to be. Right? How do I make that work within the legislation? Right? Instead of starting from the legislation and then working from there. Right? It's just a mindset shift, isn't it? Yeah, it's a massive mindset shift. It's such an interesting one. We'd probably go down the route of like metacognition and how we train our brain to, to think in that instance. Yeah. But uh, similarly, like. If, if we start from a, a standpoint of what can I do, you're going to miss out on a lot of the diamonds. Yeah. If we start the what could I do, well, yeah. now we're looking at, all right, what could I do? I could do this. I could do this. Let's grab the the wish list. And then you start to piece together an overlay with the, the tech, the legislation, the team, the resourcing, and what that yeah. looks like. Not the reverse. The reverse, you're probably doing yourself disadvantage. There's a ton of ideas that if you start with the what can I question, you're just pushing them to the bottom and you're not actually letting them come up and be processed. And there's going to be some diamonds in there. There is. And I, and I think for, you know, I think we put a lot of demand on our tech providers to come up with these ideas, right? Whereas they can only but come from what they can or can see they can do. Whereas I bet there's been conversations you've had even in the in the you know transition to X plan where you've looked at your CX and you go, like, this is what we need to be able to do. And they're like, oh, well, yeah, sure, we can do that. You know, like it just, it changes the way they look at something. They never would have come at that just because they're working from their own base. That's natural, That's, you know. Yeah, and like to that point as well, and I will uh, call out the fact that like this is like partnering with Iris. Now, first off, hats off to them for, for actually having the, the guts or to actually do something like this because they're not naive to think that this is going to be sunshine and rainbows. Like right. the reality is that the advice tech in Australia is still catching up a little bit. Yeah. Like it's catching up to what we're trying to do. Now, the moment that we can put the ego aside and realize that that's the case, now we're into a, a far more progressive environment where we're like, what we're doing here and what we do one-on-one, whether it's with the account managers or with our other businesses, is that we're providing feedback. Mm. And the more the feedback that we provide, the smaller that feedback loop is, the quicker we're going to be able to make some changes. And I'm confident that Iris and a ton of other tech platforms in Australia or even across Australia that support us as an industry, they're going to pick it up and be like, well, hang on, <laughs> they're yeah. asking for this. we can do that. It wasn't on our runway, but they're the end users. Yeah. So if we for the end users, why not? Like that's their mandate, just like yeah. ours is, how do we design a client journey to support our clients? We are the tech platform's clients. So it is the same thing. Let's, let's just link that. And these conversations are a, a fantastic start for that. And it is, I mean, that loop is so important, is it? Because 
in my experience, I'd be curious, well, yours is a bit different because you've got a lot more embedded tech understanding, right? But from my experience, there's there's an absolute truth, which is if I think it would be easy in the tech, it's horribly difficult. And if I think there's no way they could do that, then it's like a flip of the switch and it can be done overnight, Peter. Like that's been <laughs> I always misunderstand the difficulty or ease with which something can be changed. And so that's why that feedback loop is so important because in our business, we could be holding back from asking for something or changing something because we think it's super hard and it might not be. They might go, that already exists. Guys, we can just turn that on. Look, like, you know, we've got to be talking to them. A hundred percent. And like, that's, uh, I'll call myself out. I pay a little bit of the, the dumb tax in that instance. I, I asked, uh, I can't recall which provider it was. I'm like, hey, I'm trying to do this. I don't know how to do it. They're like, it's already there. I'm like, oh, can you show me how to use it? And I had it's like one of those moments that yep. we're, not, we're all privy to, but it was just having the conversation and I'm like, I could have gone down the rabbit hole of the Google it, tried to build it, do something else and just imagine the amount of time and energy that would go into that. I, it, there's no dumb questions because if they can't do it right now, but they put it on the project one way. They can do it right now. Guess what? You've got the answer ready to go. You pick it up and then you go forth and conquer. Yeah, fantastic. Is there any, before we wrap up, is there any other advice or suggestions you'd give to practices out there who are looking to sort of really optimize, you know, their tech stack or tech stacks as you sort of outlined for you guys? Is there any other hints or tips you'd give them? Yeah, look, I think just probably really, really ingraining the fact that tech is an accelerator to what we're trying to do. Uh, just be quite wary and ensure that you're picking the path first and then the tech is there to to support that, not necessarily to instruct that. And I will caveat that with a, a lot of elements. But for us, what that looked like was client journey and team journey. And then the rest, the tech, that's what we used to formulate and build that. But we started with those things and we, we spent a ton of time on those things first and that's the real thing. And other than that, just going into any conversation when you're doing a bit of shopping, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, tech shopping, what are you trying to achieve? Map out your criteria before those conversations are had so that you can prevent the the shiny object from really infiltrating that and uh, look at there's a lot of exciting things out there. There's a lot of things that we can do and it's it's getting incredibly awesome, but it's also getting more challenging to try and pick which works best. Yeah. And only you are going to know that. And don't be afraid to try, like, particularly yeah. for, for the practices that are doing a lot more all-in-one to start with. Okay, if you're thinking about an integrated tech stack, you don't have to throw the kitchen sink and build the Rolls Royce from day one. Like This is a progress. Mm. Start with something. If you like it, fantastic. If it doesn't work, Fail fast, get rid of it, try the next thing. And like conversations like this, speaking to peers, figure out what's worked for them. But just know that every business is a snowflake as long as you know what you're trying to achieve. And that's going to be different across different businesses, which means the solution is going to be different across different businesses. It'd be pretty unlikely that someone could just pick up a tech stack from one business, chuck it in theirs and at work without requiring any changes. You've got your own customer journey. You've got your own team journey. That is going to require some sort of bespoke solution to you. Off-the-shelf product, but bespoke solution. So just sticking <laughs> true, continuing to remind yourself why you're making the decision. Tech is second. The relationship element and the journey is a, a first in, in my mind. Such good advice. And I think it's really, I mean, I get asked that all the time about, but Peter, what's the best combo? You know, and you're so right. The tech itself and then how you use it, like that is a, is a second layer. I mean, anybody can buy a particular car, but when you sit in it, you're going to have to move the seat back. You're going to change the air conditioning. You're going to have to get, you know, different music playing. It's still the same car, but it's used completely differently, you know, and so, and going different places at different speeds, you know, so it's, it's so important that we we look at our own business and our own goals. You know, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to achieve? Who are your clients? What are they trying to do? You know, it's. I completely agree. I think we would love to think there was something you could just lift off a shelf. It's not the case. You know, knowing your business well, knowing where you're going uh, is so very, very fundamental. Well, there is so much gold there, folks. So 
If this inspired you to rethink your tech stack, then I'd encourage you to head over to the IRA space on the Ensemble platform where you'll be able to kick off some of those conversations Tim mentioned with your peers, ask some questions, challenge the IRA's team on the sort of things you're trying to do. Ask that question that you think might be really hard. You never know. They might say it's already there. Um, but, you know, get excited about sort of really, really revitalizing that technology infrastructure plan. Tim, thank you so much for your time. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on. 